Suicide Squad. What a concept. This is the deal. You disobey me, you die. Try to escape, you die. You got a boyfriend? You irritate or vex me. I'm known to be quite vexing. I'm just forewarning you. You die. I'm actually not talking about that version. They're designated Task Force X. Give me a break. This ain't no task force. Let's call it like it is. Welcome to the Suicide Squad. Not talking about that version either. Assemble Task Force X. We have another suicide mission. Yahtzee! <laughs> no, not that one. We're talking about the comic, specifically the DC comic that started in 1982 by writer John Ostrander. Now, while the Suicide Squad as a concept sort of existed as far back as 1959, uh, we're really talking about the 1982 version. Task Force X was its official name, and what a great, amazing idea. The idea that the government uses supervillains for black ops missions in exchange for shaving off some of their time. I mean, it was one of the very few comics out there to focus on villains for an extended period of time and be pretty popular for it. They've tried rebooting it a few times after uh, it ended in the early 90s. Didn't do so great until about like what, like now seven years or something like that. It's, uh, it's been going fairly strong with DC with uh, their new 52 version. It's doing pretty well. So it's not a big surprise that this concept is ripe for plucking by the movies. Tell you what, let's take a look at some of the old comics, count up the tropes that we'd see, and then for each trope I see, I'm gonna take a bad comic put it 10 feet back for each trope, and blow the hell out of it. I'm gonna shoot it. Let's go get an old comic first. All right, so this is Arcane Comics. They've been in the Seattle area since 2004, so for quite a while. Uh, they offer back issues, graphic novels, of course, new comics and a subscription service, and they even carry a fair amount of uh, independent and self-published work, which is nice. So I think we can find something cool here. Let's go. First of all, Arcane Comics, that was my first time there. Fantastic store. They had such an amazing selection. At first, I bought this issue, the final issue of the uh, initial run of Suicide Squad. But you know what? Things had petered out. It was kind of boring. I just didn't want to review it. So instead, I went and got another back issue. I got this one. Suicide Squad number nine. Early in its run, when things were going well, this is going to be a fun read. Let's take a look at each of the tropes first to see what we're dealing with, and then we'll read the issue. A team member dying. A team member betraying the group. A firestorm villain being killed off. Amanda Waller blackmailing or underhandedly coercing someone to do what she wants. A crossover with a DC event. A formerly D-list villain doing something badass or impressive. A villain making a heroic sacrifice. Russians or Arabs as villains. Corrupt politicians. Let's get reading. We begin with a version of Task Force X, or the Suicide Squad, on a mission to blow up an ancient temple in a swamp. Uh, this was part of DC's Millennium crossover. Without getting too deep into the weeds, there was a robotic police force called the Manhunters, and they got out of control, and all of the DC heroes had to focus on taking them down. Task Force X is given a special mission with a special bomb to blow up a type of a headquarters. So the Millennium was a crossover. For whatever reason, Suicide Squad was involved in a lot of crossovers. Here's the lineup for the team this time. We've got Rick Flagg. He's sort of a military company man that usually keeps the team in line. We've got Bronze Tiger. He's sort of an anti-hero. He was briefly an assassin, but Mostly he's just a good guy martial artist, and he's the field leader for this mission. We've got Deadshot, sort of the world's best assassin. He's not suicidal, but he also doesn't care if he lives or dies. He ended up becoming one of the most popular characters in this run, which is kind of funny, because he was definitely a D-list character initially. Take a look at what he looked like when he first went up against Batman. Uh, we've got Captain Boomerang. He used to be a pretty D-list Flash villain. He just 
throws boomerangs. Uh, and we've got Slipknot. His whole deal was he could just make good knots and lassoes, stuff like that. Uh, and then we've got sort of two specialists on this mission. We've got Karen, who's a former lover of Rick Flagg, as well as the current lover of the Privateer. He's the last member of the team, and he used to be a Manhunter, but now he's sort of uh, his own vigilante hero. So that's the team. Captain Adam flies in and uh, learns that the bomb that the team has is made out of something called Zizidium. Who knows what that is? It's made up. But he talks to Rick Flagg and says, like, do you understand how powerful this bomb is? It's going to be huge. How will you guys ever get out in time? Rick Flagg reveals that he knows that, but the rest of the team doesn't know that. And he's keeping it that way so that they all feel that the mission is accomplishable. We only get one quick scene with Amanda Waller. Now, she was the person who put together the idea of the Suicide Squad. She was a, a government person, and she was just totally atypical of anything else you'd see in superhero comics. She was a middle-aged, kind of hefty black woman, but she knew how to use the system, and she knew how to manipulate other people. She was very crafty, underhanded, very tough, uh, but... In this, we really only get a snippet of her saying that she knows that she sent these guys on what amounts to a suicide mission. The heroes drive their totally bizarre bomb that looks like a car mixed with some sort of a, a swamp boat, uh, and they bump into some manhunters, some robots. And basically, none of the team is much use against them because these are tough robots, and you've got guys that throw boomerangs, shoot regular guns, or throw lasso ropes? Uh, that's a little bit of a stretch as to why Amanda Waller would have recruited this particular team. Early on, Bronze Tiger actually gets his knee pretty much shattered. He goes in for a martial arts kick, but meets Metal. He's kicking a robot, and uh, he's incapacitated for the rest of this mission. So right off the bat, the team is facing pretty severe odds. They are big underdogs. And that was a big part of the appeal of this book, was seeing people that were villains. They were usually the D-list villains. They were expendable. They were always considered underdogs on every mission. And the cool thing was, a lot of times they'd get killed off in the issue, so you never knew who was going to survive. So this is kind of funny and also just like a perfect example of a bunch of tropes. Uh, Captain Boomerang was just the total asshole of the group. You could not trust this guy. Slipknot goes, hey, these, uh, these wristbands that they put on us, they say that they're bombs and they'll explode if we uh, go off mission. Is that true? Captain Boomerang's like, no, nah, I don't think so. I don't think I believe that. So Slipknot feels like, you know, what good are my ropes going to do anyway? And he makes a run for it. Well, the bomb goes off and it blows off his whole arm. Team member dying. He doesn't die right away, but Slipknot is done for. A Firestorm villain dying. That's right, for some reason Slipknot was a Firestorm villain, and Firestorm's villains died a lot in Suicide Squad. Probably because he had a pretty weak rogues gallery. Team member betrayal. This is kind of a cool moment. Uh, Captain Boomerang runs out of boomerangs and asks Deadshot if he can hang out close to him. Deadshot gets a pretty badass line here. He goes, yeah, it's fine by me, but the joke's on you. I'm out of ammo, too. Rick Flagg and the privateer decide to basically abandon the rest of the team, although they couch it as you handle the Manhunter robots, and they drive the car into the building to blow it up. And in there, they encounter Karen, who'd already snuck in, and she's uh, falling from a ledge. Rick Flagg catches her, and then she pulls a gun on him. Karen reveals that after the last time she and Rick broke up, she got together with the privateer, and they were together. Now the privateer comes back and says, yeah, the only thing about your story is, um, I don't work for the Manhunters like you think I do, I used to, and the version of me that you've been with, I was in prison during that time. You were with an android version of me. The Manhunter stuns Rick Flagg, stuns Mark, the privateer, and orders Karen to kill Rick Flagg. She's about to, and then she remembers that they weren't all bad times with Rick Flagg, and she still kind of loves him. 
right at that moment when everybody is in trouble, all of a sudden all the Manhunters break. This must have happened in another issue of this crossover. This is why sometimes crossovers do not work, because talk about a deus ex machina. All of a sudden the team isn't really in danger anymore from at least most of these Manhunters. They all just break. And they don't just shut down, their limbs literally detach. So, I'd be curious who programmed that. With Rick Flagg stunned, Karen decides that she will drive the car bomb the rest of the way, and she just plows through the remaining Manhunters that are all sort of broken anyway. But they do cause her to crash, and uh, she can't escape from under the car as the bomb's timer ticks down. Karen's sacrifice did give the rest of the team enough time to leave well before they planned on. So the rest of the team survives, uh, but Karen does not. So even if we didn't count Slipknot's arm blowing off as, as getting killed, because he survives for a little while, Karen was a member of the team and she dies. So that's the issue. Uh, that's one, two, three, four tropes. Not as many tropes as we normally come across, but you know what? That's okay. I'm going to go take an issue of Suicide Squad. I think I'll take issue 66. Let's put it back 40 feet, shoot it to hell. say I'm kind of proud of myself. I haven't shot a gun in years and uh, at 40 feet I was able to get a pretty tight grouping. I decided to shoot at Captain Boomerang and you'll see that that's a, that's a fairly tight grouping. Uh, you can stick finger right through there. <laughs> that's, that's the back. <laughs> so that was actually kind of fun <laughs> to just shoot up an issue that I thought was boring. Uh, Suicide Squad had a fantastic premise. There's only a few good story arcs in there, but the ones that are good are really good. It definitely elevated uh, Deadshot to a much higher level. He's a really cool character now. He's something... Not, he's somebody that you shouldn't trifle with in the DC Universe. He's a crack shot. He's smart. He, uh... He's not suicidal, doesn't really care about living or dying, except he does have kids out there and he wants to provide for them. So he's become kind of dynamic. And I think that the upcoming Suicide Squad film could actually be a lot of fun. Something that maybe Man of Steel and Batman vs. Superman, I don't know how much fun they were. Maybe you enjoyed them, but it wasn't necessarily fun. Even though this is a pretty dark premise, I think you could have a lot of fun with it. I also think, after reading this particular issue, I won't be surprised if Captain Boomerang does the same thing to Slipknot in the movie that he did in this comic. Who knows? Anyway, hope you had fun. Uh, the next two episodes, I'm going international. I'm going to do an episode from London and an episode from Vancouver, Canada. So, uh, get ready. They're going to be themed. Keep reading comics.